And so those of you, are all of you uh, graduate students in research now? How many of you are working uh, in studies involving the use of laboratory animals? Okay, so a good proportion. Um, I thought I would start out with a few things that um, I found on the web and kind of show you what some of the feelings are out there and what some of the concerns of folks who would not like to see us be involved in animal research and then what some of the safeguards are and uh, guidelines to help us do research in a humane manner. So this is actually a poster that's put out by the Foundation of Biomedical Research, <laughs> which is one of the organi organizations in support of research, biomedical research. And this is another poster, effective, but actually small in number compared to the posters that are being put out by other groups. Okay, so that kind of gets me started into ethics, and there's a wide range of opinions, and people who believe in animal rights are different than those who believe in animal welfare. The people who believe in animal rights feel that animals have a right not to be used in research. They have a right not to be slaughtered for food. They have a, cows have a right not to give milk, and sheep um, have a right not to be shorn, and actually some of these more extreme animal rights uh, individuals and groups feel that you shouldn't have pets at home because if you're locking them up in your house, then you are interfering with their natural rights to be out in the environment taking care of themselves. Um, while fortunately those who are so extreme about animal rights are in a minority, I, ho I, I hope that most of us believe in animal welfare and those of us who believe in animal welfare feel in general that it is okay to use animals in these various pursuits, but only under certain circumstances, only if uh, pain and distress are minimized with the understanding that all animals can um, feel pain and distress uh, and that that capacity is similar among vertebrates. Although I'm going to be spending this lecture talking about what uh, how uh, biomedical research using animals is um, regulated in the U.S., there are a number of international guidelines. And in fact, um, there has been more consensus to bring harmonization to the guidelines uh, around the world. Um, so, with that in mind, uh, in the past decade, there was the first international meeting on harmonization of animal uh, use uh, guidelines. And I'll spend most of the time talking about the animal welfare um, regulations that impact us. And first, we have the Animal Welfare Act, which I will say more about. There is the Public Health Service Policy on Humane Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. This is the NIH policy. There is the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. Um, ALAC, the Association for Assessment uh, and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care. And there is the report of the American Veterinary Medical Association panel on euthanasia, which impacts how we are able to use animals. In addition to that, there are state and local guidelines that have some impact, which we'll talk about. So let's start with the Animal Welfare Act. And this was passed in 1966. First, it was called the Laboratory Animal Welfare Act uh, at first. And it was pa passed in great part in response to an article that had appeared in Life magazine entitled uh, Laboratories are Concentration Camps for Dogs, Your Pet is in Cruel Danger. And actually, the, um, this article alleged that pet dogs and cats were being taken from their, their front and back lawns and diverted into the research stream. 
So this very first Animal Welfare Act really only had to do with, uh, with dogs and cats, regulation of dogs and cats. Um, the AWA was amended in 1970, 76, 85. In its current iteration, it covers all warm-blooded animals except mice, rats, and birds. Uh, it also, uh, all, I should say, all warm-blooded um, mammals. So it doesn't cover, f uh, well, wait a second. <laughs> Let's get this straight. I guess I am correct. So that's interesting because what are we here in research? We are about 90 to 95% rats and mice. And so the majority of the animals that are used in biomedical research in this country are actually not covered by the Animal Welfare Act. The Animal Welfare Act is administered by the United States Department of uh, Agriculture, the Animal Care Branch, and it talks about proper housing and feeding and care and sanitation and so forth. It also requires the establishment of an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, which I will talk about, and it requires registration and licensure of all facilities conducting research. So Case Western Reserve does hold a license uh, through the USDA to conduct research. The United States uh, Department of Agriculture is the enforcement arm for the Animal Welfare Act. Uh, this organization conducts unannounced inspections, so they have veterinary uh, inspectors that usually pop in um, and on a Monday morning, which is when we are at our greatest disarray and we drop everything and we, uh, we show the inspector around. They will review our facilities, they will check our animals, they will review our records, but they won't go into any of our uh, rodent room, uh, uh, any of our rat and mouse rooms because rats and mice aren't covered. And in fact, we have one of our animal facilities in the Wolstein building is entirely mice and the USDA veterinary inspector doesn't even walk in the door there. So there's a big, a big uh, piece uh, that she is not looking in. The USDA inspection has the authority to levy fines. If they find problems, they can take pictures. In fact, they are obligated to take photographs if they see the same problem twice. Uh, they can cause us to uh, cease research. Uh, and the reports of their inspections and of our annual reports to the USDA are available to the public on the USDA APHIS animal care website. So they just actually opened a very nice searchable uh, website. And so if you want to see what's happening with Case Western Reserve's animal research or Cleveland Clinic, you want to search by deficiency, you can do that too. The PHS policy or the Public Health Service uh, policy uh, was also passed by the Research Extension Act in 1985 and it is enforced by the Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare of the National Institutes of Health. This policy covers all vertebrate animals used in research. So rats and mice are covered by this policy, including the fish and frogs and so forth. It requires the establishment, again, of an animal care and use committee, and it requires adherence to this book called The Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. And this guide has just come out with the eighth edition um, in January of this year. And so we are actually in the process of taking a look at our program again and uh, assuring that we now meet the new guidelines that are in this, this book. Um, all NIH-funded institutions must have an assurance on file with, the, with OLA. Then there is ALAC. ALAC is the acronym for Assessment and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care. It's an international organization. It accredits uh, approximately 800, uh, uh, laboratory, uh, 800 institutions using laboratory animals around the, around the world. Most of them are within the U.S. And accreditation is based on this book, the guide, and also on the legislation of the country that is being um, evaluated. It is a voluntary system of animal facility accreditation. So uh, actually, prior to 1990, Case Western Reserve was not accredited by ALAC, and we could receive NIH funds. 
Um, but having this accreditation indicates that we are state of the art. It's essentially the gold standard uh, for laboratory animal facilities. So this organization was established in 1967, and that was very close to the time that the Animal Welfare Act was passed, and the impetus driving the establishment of this, of ALAC, was the same public uh, pressure to have more regulation uh, covering animals used in uh, medical research. And the folks who founded ALAC said, we don't need federal legislation. We can be self-regulating. And so uh, this uh, formation of ALAC was designed really to kind of thwart the passage of the Animal Welfare Act. Well, Animal Welfare Act did pass, but ALAC actually remained a very strong um, uh, agency uh, and uh, uh, covered, uh, still has a, a strong input on the way we, we manage animal facilities. There is the AVMA guidelines on euthanasia and uh, this is a document that is published periodically by the American Veterinary Medical Association and it describes the permissible and non-permissible ways to kill animals and the Animal Welfare Act, uh, the PHS policy and uh, ALAC require adherence to these guidelines. Um, interestingly, uh, these guidelines don't really pertain particularly to research. They pre pertain to all methods of killing animals for food, for sport, and for other, um, other um, uh, requirements. And up until recently, there wasn't even a laboratory animal veterinarian on this panel. So some of the guidelines that they published are a little bit strange. Uh, to us in the research field. It is possible to do research and kill animals or euthanize animals in a way that is, uh, that is not supported by this document, but your Animal Care and Use Committee needs to approve it. So some of the specific guidelines include not using uh, potassium chloride or paralytic agents in euthanasia of unanesthetized animals because this, these uh, agents will just cause muscular paralysis but not loss of con consciousness so the animals actually die of asphyxiation. Uh, not using carbon dioxide generated from dry ice. Um, requirement that personnel using physical means of euthanasia, euthanasia such as cervical dislocation or decapitation be qualified. Uh, and trained to do these procedures because in one person's hand it can be humane, in another person's hand it may not be humane, and only that these procedures are done only when scientifically justified and not as a routine means of euthanasia. Uh, they also require that animals must be dead after they're euthanized, and that may sound silly, but if uh, every once in a while uh, people will discard animals that you think are dead, and then we find them in our postmortem cooler crawling about their dead brethren, and that's something that uh, is disturbing and also reportable to our various agencies. There are also state and local laws and institutional policies. Um, very few states have actual laws governing animal research, but most states have anti-cruelty laws. Um, of interest to us are the fact that some but not all states have pound seizure laws and this allows uh, research institutions or middlemen to obtain animals from county pounds and shelters and put them into the research stream. So across the country about 10 million dogs are euthanized in county pounds each year. Um, these are animals that are picked up as strays. Their owners don't claim them, and they can and and they're not adopted. And so the pound seizure laws in uh, the states that are uh, marked in in yellow and red on this map. So they're actually in the minority now. Um, 
they allow for a research institution or a middleman that is licensed by the USDA to go to the pound at the point that these animals would be killed by the pound and purchase them for research. So these are animals that we don't know the health status of them, we don't know where they came from, and I was not in favor of using these animals. Um, but they were used here at, at Case because they were less expensive. And so uh, obtaining a dog like that with an unknown health status and unknown background through a middleman costed our investigators about $350, which is a lot of money for a dog that, whose health status that you don't know. Whereas um, purchasing a dog that was bred specifically for research and came to us with a health status and a full vaccination history cost upwards of $1,000. And so we, I could not um, convince our Animal Care and Use Committee to put a stop to this. But as of a year ago, or March of last year, the dean, together with the president of the university, decided that this was an inappropriate practice, primarily because it gives us very bad public relations. And so they have abandoned this. So we have no more random source dogs here at Case. And uh, I think that was a, a good move on many, um, many levels. So the question is, are laboratory animals in the US exempt from any sort of oversight? Are there institutions that have laboratory animals that have no regulations whatsoever? And the answer is yes. So remember, the Animal Welfare Act doesn't cover rats and mice. So if you are using rats and mice, and you are in an institution that does not receive NIH funds, so you're not subject to the public health service policy, and you choose not to be accredited by ALAC, there is no guidelines or regulations whatsoever that's going to cover your use of laboratory animals. In practice, this is rare. But it is possible because it, occur, it could occur in small academic institutions that only use rats and mice and don't receive uh, grant funding from the NIH. And it could also occur in private labs using only rats and mice. So what do the regs say? Well, the regs talk a lot about how we care for animals or husbandry, how often we have to feed them, how we transport them, how big their cages have to be, the fact that living conditions need to fit the needs of each species. They talk about research, that you shouldn't be doing research for nothing. You should be doing research for an appropriate purpose, either to enhance human or animal health or advance knowledge or somehow benefiting society. And you should use the right uh, type of animals. So you should use the appropriate species and quality of animals. So if you were going to be studying gallbladder disease and you decided you were going to use rats to do that, that would be a bad choice because rats don't have gallbladders. Or if you wanted to be studying some sort of heart physiology and you chose a dog that was infected with heartworms, which some of these random source dogs actually were infected, that's also a bad choice you need to use the right number. You can use lots and lots of animals and have lots and lots of data and analyze it and, uh, and draw conclusions, but you have wasted animal life under those circumstances. Or you can use just a handful of animals and not have enough data to draw a scientific conclusion. So under those circumstances, you've wasted, life, or wasted animal life as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. And this is mandated by the Animal Welfare Act, the PHS policy, and ALAC. Um, all research studies must have approval by this IACUC prior to ordering animals and commencing research. And this committee includes at least one scientist with a direct or delegated responsibility for the laboratory animal, or at least one veterinarian with direct or delegated responsibility, and one member of the public who has no connection with the university. And this committee is empowered to grant exceptions to any regulation that um, impacts the use of laboratory animals, but only for a valid scientific purpose and not for cost savings or teaching purposes. 
So the IACUC reviews every research uh, protocol involving animals and they can require modification, they can approve it, they can require modifications to secure approval or they can withhold approval. They also are empowered to monitor ongoing activity using animals and they are empowered to suspend activities when necessary or to take corrective action and they are required to notify the USDA and funding and accreditation agencies if research is suspended. They are also required to conduct a semi-annual review of all of animal housing areas, of animal use areas, and also of the animal care and use program itself. So really the IACUC is the one body that has the power over uh, the research process over here. So the IACUC reviews and investigates concerns which might originate from public complaints or personnel or, apply or employee concerns and according to the Animal Welfare uh, Act there can be no uh, retaliation against someone who reports a concern to the IACUC and we have animal incident report forms so they are in the IACUC office, they are available on the uh, the IACUC website so that if you have a concern, if you see something going on in your lab, if you see something going on within the animal facility either or somebody else's lab that you think is improper, then you can, feel, you can report it to the IACUC anonymously if you wish and the IACUC will, um, will follow up on it. So principal investigators assume responsibility for following all of these requirements. They have to complete the, the protocol form in sufficient detail so that the IACUC can understand what's going on and uh, use of a lot of technical jargon is um, uh, difficult for the IACUC to follow. A lot of times uh, people put a lot of information in their protocol drawn from their grant which actually doesn't impact the animal use at all and uh, sometimes they use technical jargon that's only understandable to others in their field. They are required to report any personnel and procedural changes. So if you are new to your lab, somebody should be adding you to the protocol before they bring you down to the animal facility and before they have you handling animals. And that is sometimes a problem. They certainly should not be giving anybody uh, or not be giving you their ID card and say, here, take my ID card and go do this. The PI must maintain a prop, proper records. They, have, they are responsible for assuring that their personnel are appropriately trained. Um, and then the components of an IACUC protocol include the plain language descript, description of the purpose and the importance of the research. And this needs to be understandable to a high school student. And uh, you know, by the time you, you get into your field, um, you've, you've picked up a whole new language and you can't always communicate with people outside of your field. Um, it should describe all of the experimental procedures involving animals so that the IACA can kind of understand them and also understand the timeline of what's happening. So you can't say, well, I'm going to do surgery and I'm going to take blood and I'm going to inject um, the IACUC needs to be able in reading this protocol to understand that for a given animal what's going to happen as for each animal what's going to happen uh, as they go through this research process. You need to rule out duplication of research, indicate that you're, you're, what you're doing is novel. Of course in the case of teaching you are duplicating but you're duplicating it for a, uh, a valid need. You need to justify why you are using the species that you chose and the number of animals and you have to explore less painful and less distressful alternatives to any of the painful procedures that, um, that you propose to do. So you have to assure the IACUC that you are using the least painful and distressful procedures that are available to get your scientific goal. You need to also describe the euthanasia method and um, specify the training and qualifications of all personnel and what they will be doing. So 
on the bottom of the screen, we've got three animals that are used uh, in the laboratory for different purposes. Um, the one on the left is a chinchilla. Um, and this animal has a very acute hearing and a very large middle ear and is used a lot in hearing studies. So it's a specialized animal for specialized use. The pigs in the middle um, are large animals. They're used primarily uh, for surgical models. They also are one of, other than primates, they're relatively close to us in terms of having similar cardiovascular system, similar uh, gastrointestinal system. Um, and so they are actually a good model. They've replaced in large part the dogs that have been used in research um, because they are a better model in many respects. They are more acceptable to the public who eats them and can understand them being used for research a little better than dogs. But the downside to pigs is that they are less easy to handle. So you need specialized handling techniques. Pigs aren't going to sit quietly on a table for you while you examine them. And they are going to complain loudly if uh, you're doing something that they don't like. And then the little guy on the, on the right is a nude mouse, an athymic nude mouse. So this, this um, mouse was actually a spontaneous mutation that occurred in the 60s. And it was found that these animals did not develop a thymus. Uh, and the hair, the fact that they don't have hair was kind of a side effect because the, the primordial uh, cells that go into the development of the thymus and the hair shafts are deficient. And so these guys, without the um, cellular component of their immune system, are able to accept grafts. They can, um, they can accept grafts from other non-related mice. They can accept. Um, they can accept from other species. They can also have, they've transplanted um, chicken feathers, skin with, a chicken skin with feathers and fish scales, and these, these mice do not reject it. They are used primarily for cancer research because you can take a human cancer cell line or you can actually take a human tumor that you have um, biopsied from a patient and put it in these mice and it will grow and you can study the biology of the tumor. So we are required for every procedure that you're going to do that causes um, more than momentary or slight pain, you're obligated to search for alternatives. Um, these two fellows, uh, Russell and Birch, uh, published a book called The Principles of Humane Experimental Technique in 1959, and they talked about the three R's. And the three R's are replacement, reduction and refinement. And Russell and Birch contended that if you paid attention to these three R's, then you could go a, a long way to minimizing pain and distress in animals used for research. And so when we talk about replacement, we are talking about using non-animal models instead of animals, such as computer simulations or mannequins for training. Or we're talking about using animals that are, uh, or using tissue, uh, tissue ex vivo work, uh, or in vitro studies instead of whole animal studies. Or we are talking about using lower level animals instead of higher level animals. So if you have a study that would be quite elegant to do with a rhesus monkey, but you really can do that study and get the same results with a rat, then you should be using the lowest level animal. In terms of reduction, we talked about that. You should, other than what is necessary, duplication to verify a technique, you should not be duplicating research. You should be using the fewest number of animals required to make a scientific conclusion. You should use, you should present a statistical justification for the numbers of animals that you're going to use in your group sizes. Um, and this sometimes involves doing pilot studies so that you can determine what the variability is so that you can make a reasonable estimate on the numbers of animals. Also, uh, doing things like tissue and organ sharing is a way to decrease the animal use. So the 
Animal Resource Center is a good repository of that information, so we know what animals are going into different um, projects at any point in time, and so if all you need is some pig skin to do something uh, in the laboratory, we can hook you up with somebody who will be using a pig for a non-survival procedure. And then the refinement is the aspect that is most complex, and that's minimization of pain and distress. Um, it can involve using anesthetics and analgesics to minimize uh, surgical and post-surgical pain. Uh, it can include using environmental enhancement uh, to minimize psychological distress. So for instance, when you're working with sheep, sheep really don't like being alone. They get, most, they get depressed. They don't do well, so if you put two sheep together in a cage, then they buddy up, and the sheep that has had the surgical procedure actually does much better. A refinement might, may, might mean using less invasive surgical techniques. So example of that, when I started in this field, um, in order to do the middle cerebral artery occlusion model in rats, it involved taking off the zygomatic arch and doing a lot of bony dissection uh, to get directly to the middle cerebral artery, artery. And that caused significant postoperative pain. And now, uh, replacement involves threading a cath catheter through the internal carotid and blocking the middle cerebral artery that way. And uh, that's a much less painful procedure because it involves just a small incision into the neck. It's also important to establish humane endpoints for every procedure. So sometimes um, debility and distress and pain are secondary to the research that you're doing, and sometimes they are just incidental and they're caused by something else. But we want to know how sick an animal is going to have to get before they get a humane euthanasia. And a lot of times, um, investigators have invested a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of effort into a, into a particular animal model. And if that animal model gets sick, either as a consequence of the experiment that they're doing or with a spontaneous um, illness, it is very difficult for them to agree to euthanize it. And that pits the Animal Resource Center staff against the investigators because the ARC staff says, well, you know, this animal is suffering and really needs to be euthanized. And the investigator says, yes, my study will end in September, and then I will euthanize this animal. So having these um, endpoints written down and approved in the protocol helps us from getting into a battle of wills with investigators. Um, I want to talk a little bit about postoperative pain relief uh, because um, how many of you have had surgery? Okay, so when you were in the hospital, how did you get pain relief? How did you tell, how did you tell the nurses and the doctors that you needed pain relief? You had a little button, right? Press the button and somebody came in and you said, I need more pain relief and they gave it to you. Well, laboratory animals don't, don't have that. And so historically, when, when animals were subject to surgery, they didn't get pain relief. Just like human newborns didn't get pain relief because they couldn't push the button either. Um, and then we got to the point, well, maybe we should be treating their pain. And so then we got to the stage that said, okay, we're going to look at that animal. If he looks painful, then we are going to get rid of his pain. We're going to address his pain. But animals, many animals don't express pain well. And even those who express pain that maybe a conspecific animal would recognize, we humans can't recognize. And so we had lots of studies where they said, we're going to give pain relief if we notice that the animal is, going to, is in pain, and the end result was nobody ever noticed. Animals never got pain relief. So now, whenever we are doing a procedure that involves uh, acute pain, we ask you to specify what you're going to use, and then we make you use it for all the animals. 
um, a mandatory for a certain period post-op. This way, you don't have to ask yourself, is the animal in pain? This way, you're more consistent because all animals are receiving the same medication. Um, so all of us know what pain is. Uh, oh, let me, let me address this. Uh, so in the course of refine, refinement, we need to do a, a, a uh, database search. We need to do at least two database searches. We have to have appropriate keywords so that we are likely to find alternatives that are actual refinements to our procedure. A lot of times investigators will put in the keywords that they use to keep abreast of their field. But those keywords may not necessarily direct them to be looking for refinements to pain and distress in their animal models. You should say what dates you used, and you have to have a narrative description. So that means that when you answer the questions on uh, reduction, refinement, and replacement, you don't say no alternatives were found. You say we found these alternatives and they were unacceptable, or we found these alternatives and this is what we're going to do. OK, so now we get down to pain and distress. Um, so we talked about animals not expressing pain, and in fact, those animals that are prey animals that are eaten by other animals out in the wild are the ones that don't express pain well because it's, it's not in their best interest to express pain. So if you had a deer that was out you know, on the prairie and looked like it was sick, then the predator is more likely to go after that one. So these animals tend to hold themselves together until they're pretty well ready to drop. And this covers rats and mice and guinea, uh, rodents, uh, rabbits, and um, the hoofstock are all very poor in expressing pain. And then distress is a little bit different. We all know when we're in pain, but we don't always recognize when we're in distress. Distress is more like a mental pain. So you might take an animal that is normally a social animal and likes to be with other members of its own species and stick it in a cage where it's all by itself, it's not in pain, food and water, a clean place to live, but it's unhappy, it's lonely. And so we need to address that sort of issue as well. We also need to understand the difference between acute pain and cr chronic pain. So pain is an acute physical sensation. It's caused either by in injury or the threat of injury. And acute pain is usually associated with traumatic injury. It's rapid in onset. It doesn't last for too long a time. And it is responsive to painkillers. Chronic pain, on the other hand, is associated with a long-standing disease process like arthritis or cancer. It is slow in onset, long duration, and it is more poorly responsive to analgesics. And distress, as we talked about, is an unpleasant emotional sensation that can actually impact animals. So pain and distress can be relieved by pharmacologic agents, anesthetics, analgesics, tranquilizers, by environmental changes, by more human attention, by putting another sheep in the pen, and by interventional euthanasia. So if you can't relieve pain and distress by any other means, that's where we get to uh, mandatory euthanasia. The USDA um, has four pain categories, and if you get involved in writing a protocol, then you will have to figure out which one of these categories um, your animals fall under, and they are not particularly intuitive. So category B are, which you never see, you always wondered where the category B is. And category A, even I don't know what category A is, but so we'll start with category B. These are animals that are not yet entered into the research study, so animals that might be part of your uh, breeding colony. Category C are studies associated with minimal or momentary pain and distress. So injection, blood withdrawal, brief restraint would fall under category C. Category D is not, does not mean a little more pain than category C and a little less pain than category E. What it means is studies in which 
pain and distress are relieved by anesthetics or analgesics. Oh. So, cat, so all animals that have surgery, whether the surgery involves something very minor or very severe, as long as anesthetics are being used and as long as post-operative pain relief are being used, fall into category D. And any studies in category D require, requires that alternative search. Category E are studies are, is reserved for studies in which pain relieving agents may not be used because they would interfere with the ob objective of the study. So studies involving death as an endpoint where the animals are allowed or must go on to the point of death um, would fall into category E. Um, category E requires that same alternative search. It requires a scientific justification. And if these category E animals are USDA covered animals, then we have to send our annual report to the USDA and list these procedures and the reasons for why the IACUC approved them. And again, these category E procedures are available on the IACUC website. So um, a number of animals have surgery as part of their, their research. And all surgery uh, in animals must have um, appropriate anesthesia, pain relief. They must, you must use proper aseptic technique, which includes at a minimum uh, clipping of the surgical site uh, and scrubbing the surgical site using autoclaved instruments. Um, for USDA, um, I should say for non-rodents, for mammals that are non-rodents, surgery must be performed in a dedicated operating theater, which is, uh, it's either our main OR that we have in the School of Medicine. It could be we have one at Metro, and we also have an OR at Wickenden, which could be used. But these animals cannot have survival surgery in laboratory space. In contrast, rodents, including USDA covered rodents such as guinea pigs and hamsters, um, they can have surgical pr procedures in your lab in a space that is temporarily dedicated to uh, surgical asepsis at the time of the surgery. However, we encourage, we encourage you to do the surgery within the Animal Resource Center. And uh, a lot of times you will be using hazardous agents. You might be using infectious diseases, recombinant DNA, radioisotopes, uh, carcinogens, or other toxic chemicals. And you should be aware that there is a second layer of approval that goes with the use of any of these agents. So there are committees that will review each of your use of these agents. Uh, and what they're looking for is how your work in your laboratory is being done safely so that laboratory personnel are not being exposed. But they're also looking for how the work within the Animal Resource Center is being done safely so that Animal Resource Center personnel who take care of the animals and who dump the dirty cages are not being exposed. There are some protocols that require a little more cautious review. And here's a list. So if there's unrelieved pain, death as an experimental uh, endpoint, multiple survival surgeries where an animal has to go through several surgical procedures, paralytics or neuro neuromuscular blocking drugs which do not alter consciousness without anesthesia, um, examples of food and water deprivation, exemptions of, from exercise or space requirements, uh, unusual means of euthanasia, and all use of non-human primates get closer review. And then the last thing that I'm going to talk about is how we, within, the, um, within Case Western Reserve, verify compliance. And this is a big issue for us. And it's a big issue for every uh, research institution in the US because in the US, 
it is the institution, not the individual investigator, that bears the burden of regulatory um, compliance. So um, this is not the case, for example, in England. So if you were doing research in England, every researcher, every principal investigator obtains his or her own license to do certain research procedures on certain animals. And if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, then his operation gets closed down, but his neighbor in the next bay, he, they can continue working. Well, if we are non-compliant in a big way, if one investigator is non-compliant in a big way at this institution, then there's the risk that all the research can be shut down. So we are kind of like this. We're worried, you know, from day to day whether something like this is going to happen. And so then you ask yourself, well, why do these, why does noncompliance happen? Because after all, we invest a lot of, a lot of effort into training. So there is, you know, there is this drive to get publications. There is competition for grant funding. Um, there are need to graduate in a timely manner. So there are things that tend to push you to cut corners, perhaps. There is willful noncompliance where you know what you're supposed to be doing and you decide that you're not going to do it. But in my opinion, most of the noncompliance is ignorance. So what do we do when this happens? Well, first of all, how do we know that it's happening? Because our operation is like this anthill. So the Animal Resource Center is like in one of those little rooms there on the bottom, and you guys are all over the anthill, and we don't know what's going on. We're not in your laboratories. We're not even all over the Animal Resource Center to see what's going on. So how do we know this? So we can, we look through the protocol um, to spot uh, potential problems. Uh, we can spot problems during the training process, during surgery, during ordering. So if you come in, you try to order a rat, but all you have are protocols for mice, then we're going to stop you so you can't order rats. But if you try to order mice for a certain research project and you've used up all your animals for that project, but you have another protocol that has animals on it for a different project, we may not catch that, but that's also illegal. So you can't do that either. New personnel coming down into the animal facility with their boss's key card, that's a problem. Uh, so not having an IACUC protocol or doing a procedure that's not on the IACUC protocol. So if we see something that is going on and it looks unusual to us because we don't, we don't keep all of the protocols in our heads, we can go back, we can verify that you have approval to do this, ordering animals with the wrong protocol number, not notifying significant changes, not adding staff or having staff that's untrained. Inadequate post-procedural care. So, you know, as I said, not only does, does your laboratory animal not have a button to call for the nurse, but he doesn't have a telephone to call his lawyer either. So if he's not getting post-operative care, the animal is not going to tell us. And so you are obligated, you are obligated to provide this care for your animals. And the only way that we know that you have provided the care for the animals is if you write it down. So if you've been in that room and you're looking at your animals and you're not making any notation or documentation, we don't know that it's being done. Uh, you need to follow whatever biosafety precautions are in your protocol. Uh, and, you know, there is housing of animals in your lab, which um, is a common low-level problem. So it's really convenient to have your animals right there in your lab where you can work on them. Um, and you save on per diem charges sometimes. But the bottom line is that if your animals are there, then your laboratory has to fulfill all of the requirements for an animal facility. Um, and there are individual investigators who have uh, authorization to do this housing because they can't accomplish their goals in the main facility. Either they need specialized equipment or something like that. But if it's a matter of convenience, you shouldn't be housing animals in your lab. So what do we do if we find a problem? 
So first we identify what is it. And how do we identify it? These are all the people who might be telling us that there's a problem. And we're going to respond to it either on the level of the ARC veterinary staff or the IACUC or the regulatory or granting agency. So the first thing that we generally do is that you will be contacted either by a veterinarian or veterinary technician and we tell you what the problem is, why it's a problem, what you need to do to solve this problem. So this is the Tower of Babel and this is all about good communication so that we communicate with you and that you communicate with us. And so the first time, if the first time this problem has occurred, we are going to assume that this was a problem of ignorance and we are going to make an appointment with you. We're going to tell you why it was a problem and how you can resolve it. If you need any training or retraining, then we'll provide that. We will document it and make this documentation available to the IACUC. Um, and we will follow up to make sure that everything is, uh, remains appropriate. But it's not, it's not part of a meeting and it's not part of a minutes. But then, what if you're like this guy? So we found him, we found he had a problem, we trained him, he knows what he's supposed to be doing but he chooses not to do it. So we've established the documentation. In this case, these sorts of issues of compliance go to the full IACUC uh, and there is a process in the IACUC of how to investigate non-compliance and it really depends, depends on the strength of each institution's IACUC what the outcome is. So what are we going to do? We ask ourselves a couple of questions. Is this serious? Was there uh, animals placed at risk or not? Or were there humans placed at risk or not? Is it continuing? Is this happening more than once? Were there harm to the animals? There's a subcommittee that's appointed. They sequester research in, uh, records and they do an investigation. And then they report back to the full IACUC who actually does the vote on what's going to happen. Is this com compliance? Is it not? What are we going to do about it? And so then hopefully we, we wash you clean of all your, your sins at this point and it doesn't happen again. So what might the IACUC require? It could be any one of these things. We could require counseling. We could require training. We could require temporary or permanent suspension. And if suspension is the outcome, then your granting agency gets notified. And we notify the institutional it, uh, official who is the vice dean for the School of Medicine. And then we, we uh, inform the granting agency and if it's a USDA covered animal, the USDA and uh, ALAC. And then when we're all said and done, then hopefully we can sleep well at night. So that covers my presentation. Do you have any questions that I can answer? I was told you were a strong but silent bunch. Okay, so we will have more of an opportunity to discuss this afternoon and I look forward to coming across you in my travels in the Animal Resource Center if animal research is your area and you can feel free to uh, come by if you have any questions. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that was somebody pretending to ask a question. So I noticed that you do a lot of some preliminary studies to say you know, Yes. Yes. Would you do like a protocol to do preliminary yes. studies to determine? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so what you would do, because you can't say, you can't say I'm going to do my, my protocol after my preliminary studies are done. You've got to have approval in the beginning. And so you have to write a complete protocol for this preliminary study. But the one area is that you're not going to have very much in the way of your numbers justification. So you're going to say this is a preliminary study and I'm just using this small group. Now you could take that protocol and you could amend it and move it into the level of a full study if you wanted to and add numbers to it and add some more justification when you're ready to do that.
Okay, you've been a great audience. What's that? Oh. Um, we can end the official presentation. <laughs> we good? Okay, great. Um, so this afternoon is the last session. Very exciting. Um, so uh, you will just have.